Happy Holidays, everyone! As I continue to review every movie that has won the Razzie for Worst Picture, we find ourselves in the year 2014 looking at a movie I have previously reviewed, Kirk Cameron's Saving Christmas. It's the only Christmas movie that has won the Razzie for Worst Picture, and indeed, you can still count on one hand the number of times a Christmas or holiday movie has even been nominated. I probably shouldn't be surprised by this. We've clearly established the Golden Raspberry Foundation will give awards to movies and people for the dumbest of reasons and overlook even the most deserving of candidates. I suppose that's what happens when you open your voting to any schmuck who's willing to cough up... How much is it now? Let's see... Oh, $40! That's five blue check marks. Anyway, despite the wide variety of holiday horribleness that has graced movie theaters over the years, some of which I've talked about on this show, the only other holiday movies that were even nominated for Worst Picture are Surviving Christmas and... <laughs> That's it. That's the only one. So I suppose Kirk Cameron should be quite proud that he created what is possibly the worst Christmas movie of the modern era. Of course, Mr. Cameron claims it wasn't really as bad as the Razzies and Rotten Tomatoes and... damn near everyone else would have you believe. No, 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 no. It was all just a bunch of trolls and haters trying to bring him down and stop him from showing us the true meaning of Christmas. Of course, Mr. Cameron says a lot of things. Things I am not going to repeat here because I still have a soul. Saving Christmas is presented by Liberty University, formerly run by Jerry Falwell Jr. until that incident with the pool boy, and stars everyone's favorite fundamentalist douchebag Kirk Cameron as himself, and Darren Doan as his brother-in-law Christian White, which is so on the nose I don't even have to make a joke for it. Doan also co-wrote and directed the film, and now that I've had a chance to re-watch it, I had forgotten just how poorly made it is. It starts out with something small, like Kirk drinking hot chocolate out of an obviously empty cup, then there's the opening credits where they recycle some of the animation because they apparently didn't do enough to cover the entire sequence. Then there's the constantly shaky camera and the terrible framing and a bunch of random objects getting in the way of the shot because they clearly filmed this at what I'm guessing is the director's house and didn't bother to clean up or block anything out ahead of time. And what the hell is up with this mess? Hey, Christian! There is a sub one second POV shot entering the room before it immediately cuts back to Kirk. Why is that shot even in there? That looks janky as hell. Who edited this? James Wynn? No, apparently it was edited by the Post Mill Factory. You know, where they make post mills. Apparently the editor was not willing to attach their name to this movie. I don't blame them. Saving Christmas reminds me a lot of The Asylum in that it looks like it was thrown together very quickly and cheaply over a weekend with as few takes as possible. Except even Asylum movies usually have at least a modicum of effort behind them. This does not. Which is made especially clear when it starts audibly raining while Kirk and Christian are filming their scenes in the car. Well, we can't be bothered to reshoot. Check the gate. Good enough. What's that? ADR? Nah, Kirk's too busy saying horrible stuff about gay people. He ain't got time for that. And that's really weird, because I know for a fact some of the dialogue in this movie was done in post. There's one scene that I don't think I talked about in my original review where they had to do ADR. And it's bizarre. Between the scenes of Kirk and Christian's conversation in the car, we see DeAndre, my favorite character in the movie, sitting down for a conversation with this other guy, I think his name is Rafi or something like that, in another of the movie's poorly constructed shots. I'm pretty sure this was not Doan's first movie, but you'd never know by looking at it. And then... This happens. Three words. War. On. Christmas. Lick. My. Taint. Alright man, check this out. We gotta go on the offensive. It's like the rapper Sugar Free said, if you stay ready, you ain't got to get ready. Wait. What the hell is this? I can't say Merry Christmas at work no more. I have to say Happy Holidays. For the love of- People have been saying Happy Holidays for years, you arrogant proselytizing fuck bucket. You remember that Irving Berlin song? He wrote that in 1942. Happy Holidays, Happy Holidays. While the bells are ringing, may your wish come true. I know that's not how the song goes. I'm singing it wrong on purpose, cause I don't want a copyright strike. You heard about Area 51? What about Area 52? Oh, do we really have to come again? That's where they're keeping on the mangers and trees and nativity scenes they keep taking down. What the hell did you put in that coffee? 
You know why the Pope really stepped down? Da Vinci Code, right? Wrong. There's a whole Picasso Code. What in God's holy name are you blathering about? I figured there would be some sort of war on Christmas bullshit in this movie. I mean, Kirk alludes to that in the intro. But if you noticed, there's some people who would love to put a big wet blanket on all of this. Yeah. You. Because you keep insisting your way is the right way and you won't shut up about it. For someone who claims to be all about Jesus, you sure don't hesitate to make everything about you. But this sounds like a parody of War on Christmas Preachers, and that's puzzling. Because that does not jive with Kirk Cameron's usual shtick. It doesn't jive with the clip we just saw. He absolutely is one of those War on Christmas types, and it looked like this scene started out that way, but then it went completely off the rails and now I have no idea what they were actually trying to say. Then again, that does fit pretty well with the rest of the movie. The overarching plot device is Kirk is at a party at his sister's house, though unless his sister has converted to Judaism, I'm guessing they're somewhere else. Hey everybody, that's me. You're probably wondering how I got myself in this situation. Well, it all started when I became a born-again Christian as a teenager and began annoying the hell out of the writers on Growing Pains when I refused to do certain scenes that I deemed to be personally offensive. I'm not kidding, he actually did that. He's been this way for a while. And again, why does the movie look like this? Good lord. Anyway, Kirk's brother-in-law, Christian, is upset that DeAndre, the movie's token black guy, won't leave him the hell alone. You gotta read your emails. If we don't have Crazy Shirt Fridays, it's the end for us. Man, that's all we got. What else do we get? Floor two? You know what happens down to floor two? I don't. Don't want to find out, because I'm on floor four. You and that Rafi guy are just here to spout random nonsense that the director can dub over later, aren't you? Yep, thought so. I swear, the only part of this movie that had any effort put into it at all is the poster. Okay, the real reason Christian is bummed out is Christmas has become too commercialized and people aren't focusing on the important things during the holidays like helping the poor. And all of the pretty lights and decorations have nothing to do with Jesus, who is supposed to be the reason for the season. Kirk then tells Christian that he's completely wrong. And to explain this, he goes on to talk about the Massacre of the Innocents, which even most biblical scholars believe is a myth, and how Jesus' body was wrapped in cloth both when he was born and when he died. This is not only meaningless, but it in no way addresses Christian's concern that all the decorations inside the house have nothing to do with Jesus. Did you not hear the question, Kirk? I have my suspicions that the dialogue in the car is mostly improvised and at some point they went way too far off script and didn't realize it until it was too late and they just had to go with what they shot. Check the gate, moving on. It would explain how Christian manages to get Kirk to corpse a couple of times and how Kirk screws up the lyrics to Santa Claus is coming to town and no one caught it. You better watch out, you better not pout, you better not cry, I'm telling Tell you what. Those lines don't go in that order. Anyway, Kirk goes on to say that despite Christian's claim that Jesus was not born in December and we only celebrate his birth then because the church adopted pagan traditions regarding the winter solstice, the early church actually had plenty of reasons for celebrating Jesus' birth on December 25th and it had nothing to do with the solstice. He's not going to list any of these reasons, so you'll just have to trust him. Of course, most Christians freely acknowledge Jesus was not actually born in December and the early Christian church didn't celebrate Christmas at all. The first holiday they celebrated was Easter because the crucifixion and resurrection coincide with the Jewish holiday Passover and thus they could actually pinpoint it on the calendar and why do I have to explain this to you? The weird thing is there's a bonus feature on the DVD that's a short clip of a conversation between Kirk and some other guy who says, yeah, of course Christianity has pagan roots because we were all pagans once. So, wait, I'm confused. Did we or did we not adopt pagan traditions and absorb them into the holiday we now know as Christmas? God damn it, Kirk. Can you not keep your story straight for one DVD? Kirk also makes a tenuous at best connection between Christmas trees and Adam from the book of Genesis, who stole fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the Garden of Eden. When you steal something, you're required to put it back. Ooh, the Trump supporter says when you steal something, you're required to put it back. Well, this is rich. But how could he? Adam had already eaten it. Oh, he can put it back, but you'll have to wait a while. The only way that Adam could put the fruit back on the tree would be, as crazy as it sounds, he would have to put himself up on that tree. Yeah, that does sound crazy. I don't have a joke for that. That is completely crazy. What did Jesus do? He was the last Adam. The last Adam?
What in the bleak midwinter does that mean? Jesus was able to do what Adam could not do. He put himself up on a tree. Well, he didn't really put himself up there. The Romans gave him a boost. And it wasn't really a tree, it was a cross. But, as Kirk goes on to explain, crosses are made of wood. And trees are made of wood. And so if Jesus weighs the same as a duck, that means he's made of wood, and therefore he's the last Jedi. This must be what going mad feels like. There's also a point in this weird-ass rant where Kirk again brings up the cloth Jesus was wrapped in at birth and at death, but he doesn't actually connect it to whatever the hell he's trying to argue, so I'm not sure why he brought it up in the first place. Clearly, he thinks that cloth means something. I couldn't tell you what, as he is apparently incapable of explaining it, but he is convinced that there is something in that cloth. And then there's the story of St. Nicholas of Myra, the inspiration for what we now know as Santa Claus, who, according to legend, beat the ever-loving shit out of Arius at the First Council of Nicaea for not holding the exact same beliefs he did. As I mentioned in my original review, this story is almost certainly a myth for a variety of reasons, you can read the Wikipedia page on your own, but this is a fascinating look at how the mind of Kirk Cameron works. It's no wonder he idolizes this version of Saint Nicholas. He wants to be the guy who will enforce his own personal version of Christianity to the rest of the world, violently if necessary. Thankfully, I think he's far too much of a pussy to actually go that far, but by God he wishes he was that guy. He wants to be the one who will force the world to follow his beliefs, as they are the truth and the only truth. The problem with that is, I couldn't follow his beliefs even if I wanted to. I don't know what in the hell he believes, because so little of what he's talking about makes any goddamn sense. And yet, he seems totally convinced that it does. I am so glad he is not willing to violently enforce his beliefs, because that boy is a few sandwiches short of a picnic. But somehow his ranting and raving puts the holiday spirit back into Christian and he rejoins the party. Looks like somebody's having a moment. Mm. I wish you would have a moment of silence. And this is where the director gave himself a concussion, which honestly explains a lot. And the movie ends with a dance party for no reason, set to a terrible rendition of Angels We Have Heard on High, and then we have Kirk, astonishingly, saying materialism at Christmas is good, actually. And you will never guess how he justifies this. This is a celebration of the eternal God taking on a material body. Good lord, Kirk, if you stretch any farther, you're gonna pull something. And that's saving Christmas. Revisiting this movie was... interesting. I can't necessarily say I had fun, as this movie is not exactly enjoyable. As previously stated, it's not well made. The story is pure nonsense and the director clearly wasn't paid enough to give a shit. But it is fascinating. I find all of Kirk Cameron's movies fascinating in a what the hell is wrong with you sort of way. And I'm curious how he turned out the way he did. It'd be easy to blame it on Christianity, but I was raised in a Christian household and I didn't turn out like this. So what happened? What pushed him over the edge? Did his religion overwrite the logic center of his brain or did it simply fill a void that was already there? And what in the everlasting fuck was he trying to tell us about that cloth? Maybe we'll never know. But what I do know is the Razzies made the right call by voting this the worst picture of 2014. I've already talked about the other nominees at length. Ninja Turtles, Age of Extinction, Left Behind, all terrible in their own way. But I swear, even The Legend of Hercules had more effort put into it than Surviving Christmas. Well... I find myself in a unique position here because there's still quite a bit of December left, and I would actually like to do a proper Christmas review instead of just rehashing a movie I've already talked about. But what to do? Surviving Christmas was at least nominated for Worst Picture, but I've already talked about that, so... Hmm... I don't know, maybe I could... What, what, no, no, don't you dare! I keep on... What's in here? Yes, I still get DVDs through Netflix. I'm the one. No! Wait, 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 wait a minute. When did I become such a bitch? I'm better than this. Think about all the crap I've sat through before. Twilight. Fifty Shades, Catwoman, The Last Airbender, Movie 43, 
the worst of Adam Sandler and the ShamWow guy. But this is what's going to do me in? This Medea? Really? Medea is finally going to be my undoing? Come on. What can Medea do to me that hasn't already been done? You know what? We're doing this. Next time, a Medea Christmas. Tyler Perry, do your worst. Or, you know, you can do your best, too. That'd be fine. I like surprises. This cannot be what God wants.